prevalence of celiac disease in the general population is estimated to be approximately 1%. All right? But the estimated ratio of diagnosed to undiagnosed individuals is 1 to 8. That's massive. So the overwhelming majority of people who have celiac disease have not been diagnosed. We're missing it. One of the reasons we miss it is because we don't think about it. People coming in with all these extraintestinal manifestations of celiac disease, migraines, we are not commonly testing for celiac disease. With peripheral neuropathies, we are not commonly testing for celiac disease. With infertility, we are not commonly testing for celiac disease. We need to be thinking about these things. The average delay to diagnosis is 11 years, okay? And the typical age of diagnosis is 40 to 60 years old. This is a very different disease than the one I was taught about when I was in medical school. When I was in medical school, we were taught that it occurred in childhood. It was a childhood disease, diagnosed in childhood, had it for life. Now we're saying, wait a minute, this isn't showing up until people are significantly older. And I think the reason it's not showing up until people are older has nothing to do with the fact that they've had this undiagnosed celiac all this time, but they've had a genetic susceptibility, and now what they've had is an accumulation of environmental exposures that ultimately trip off and manifest in the development of celiac disease. That being the case, we are obligated then to go look back and say, okay, what else is there? So you have to keep thinking what else is there and what do we need to do to unburden the body in order to hopefully get the immune system to revert back to normal and quit producing these antibodies. All right, what do we do about returning you to optimal health? How do we reduce inflammation in the body? How do we reduce the autoimmune response? The way we go about diagnosing uh, celiac disease are some of the signs and symptoms that we've just gone through. There's blood tests that we'll talk about in a minute. The gold standard for diagnosing of celiac disease remains small intestinal biopsy. Response to a gluten-free diet, I think is extremely important. And from my standpoint, actually the most telling sign in terms of whether or not you've got a problem. And basically, if we eliminate gluten from your diet and you get better, we have a piece of information, rock solid. Take it to the bank, all right? Whatever all the rest of the testing shows, I think is a bit irrelevant because if we take it out of your diet and you get better, that counts. And that's probably the most important thing. And by the way, it's a cheap way to go about doing things. Genetic testing, which I would put low on the list in terms of things that I would go looking at. And if we're doing blood tests to look for celiac disease, there's a couple of tests we can look at. Now, caveats on the testing because this is all tricky. We look at things called sensitivity and specificity. Sensitivity is if you have the disease, what are the odds that my test is going to be positive that shows that you have it, okay? So how sensitive is the test to be able to pick it up? And the answer is in the case of tissue uh, transglutaminases, it's a 98% sensitive. Specificity is, okay, if the test is positive, what are the odds that you actually have the disease? Okay, and in this case, pretty good, 96% specificity. The endomycelial uh, antibodies have a sensitivity of 90%, but they have a specificity of 99%. Caveat here, these are IgA tests, all right? If you have an IgA deficiency, these tests are gonna be negative. These tests are also gonna be negative, by the way, if you've been gluten-free effectively for an extended period of time. So you may still have celiac disease, except now these tests have reverted to normal because you're not being exposed to gluten. So when you're doing the testing, your physician needs to check for total IgA. Because if you don't have IgA, and in the general population, one in 700 individuals don't have IgA, immunoglobin A. But in celiac disease, the celiac individuals, it's one in 50. So without the IgA, you then have to test for immunoglobin G uh, antibodies in order to get a better piece of information. So I'm educating you about this stuff, and I know it's a little bit technical, because I want you to make sure that you're getting the testing done properly. And you can ask the proper questions of your physician to make sure that you're getting the right information.